السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أهلا بيكم في ويبينار جديد مع Egyptian Academy of Periodontology ومعانا سبيكر مشهورة جدا ويعني احنا محظوظين انها معانا النهاردة دكتور ندى زعزوع دكتورة ندى مدرس في كلية طب الأسنان جامعة MSA وهي من الريسيرش تيم بتاع الدكتور هاني النحاس وطبعا هي ITI ممبر وعندنا محاضرة النهاردة بعنوان مور ذان سيمبل يعني اتمنى ان هي اكيد هتفوز على اعجابكم وهتبقى فيها معلومات كتيره مفيده كالعاده. اتفضلي يا دكتوره ندى احنا المايك معاك. ثانك يو سو ماتش يا دكتور يعني انا اي ام ريلي اونرد ان احنا النهارده مع بعض وان شاء الله تبقى لكتشر انترستنج وتبقى مفيده يعني وان شاء الله يعني ننبسط كده فيها ان شاء الله. انا اكشلي اي ديسايدد سمثينج يعني اي ديسايدد تو ميك ات ليتل بيت مور كلينيكال. يعني انا عارفه انه احنا من شهر ثلاثه قاعدين في البيت وقاعدين كلنا بنسمع ويبينارز وليكتشرز فاي ترايد از ماتش از بوسيبل انه الليكتشر تبقى مينلي عباره عن شيرنج كيسز وكلينيكال كيسز اكتر منها الليكتشر يعني الونج ليكتشر اوف انفورميشن وطبعا في الاخر برضو هنقول انه الكيسز بتاعتنا ايفيدنس بيسد وكل حاجه بس اي وود لايك تو ميك ات ا ليتل بيت مور كلينيكال اند انتراكتيف وتبقى خفيفه كده ان شاء الله And thank you so much, and I'm really honored to be here. Um, today we are going to discuss some cases that are more than simple, more than the simple cases that we face every day. The challenges that we see, um, uh, things that we think about, and maybe ask our colleagues and professors and mentors about their opinion of it. So what's our idea of complex cases, or the cases that are more challenging to us as clinicians and implantologists? Cases like thin ridges, like the one we can see here. When you see a thin ridge, it's really your nightmare. You really don't want to have this a lot because uh, it's not usually a straightforward case that you can just put the implant and go home happy. You have to do something about it. Uh, cases with multiple implants, uh, with more than two, three, maybe four missing teeth, neighboring teeth. Uh, also, there are challenges related to the implant positioning, the parallelism, and the prosthetic part. So this is also one of the cases that we can consider as more advanced or complex. This is with multiple disciplinary approaches, like when the patient needs implants and yet also needs uh, management for other problems than the implants, maybe periodontal problem or a start of problems and so on. Cases with soft tissue defects around the implants, and we are going to discuss one case at the end of this presentation that's going, I hope to, it's going to be interesting. Uh, and I'll tell you how we managed it and what are the options we have. Uh, also, the cases that require, as we just said, um, maybe multiple crowns, multiple prosthetic approaches, rather than the implants we are going to be placing. And of course, not, uh, not only the, the horizontal deficiencies, but also the vertical deficiencies, when we don't have enough vertical bone height and we need to place implants or perhaps not enough horizontal uh, uh, bone, so maybe you get dehiscence defects or fenestration defects and how to manage that. Let's go case by case. I'm going to present seven cases of different, uh, different approaches, different clinical situations, and we're going to discuss. I welcome interruptions uh, anytime during my presentation. It's not a problem at all. First of all, I'm going to show you a case of thin ridge that we faced Actually, this was the, the, the topic of my thesis. Um, we used to uh, augment bone using titanium mesh and xenograft. So when you have a case like this, you really want to end up like this. When you have really thin bone and a thin ridge, you want to end up by enough and sufficient bone for your implant and enough bone around the implants to um, guarantee success and survival. And this is actually our dream to have enough bone and do this. So the first case I'm going to show you is a case that maybe looks good on the clinical examination because when you see this, maybe you wouldn't think that you have a huge bone defect. The ridge from the clinical perspective looks nice, there's enough cartilaginous tissue, and maybe you think it's a straightforward case. But when you look at the cone beam, you can see that the crested part is almost 4.2 millimeters, and when you go more apically, it's 4.6 which is still not enough for our implant placement. So this case was indicated for augmentation, or we chose this case to be included in our study uh, of the PhD thesis. 
Um, the technique that I used here for flap advancement, this was the topic of my thesis. The technique I used here for flap advancement, soft tissue management, it's called the double flap incision technique. Usually what we do to advance the soft tissue is the periosteal uh, is the periosteal releasing incision, the PRI, the usual scoring that we do at the base of the flap to be able to advance the soft tissue more chronally and cover the bone or uh, achieve primary clo uh, closure and cover the bone that we augmented. So the thesis topic was to compare this double flap incision technique versus uh, the regular gold standard per australizing incision. And after the flap reflection, we placed the titanium mesh. And as you can see here, our focus was mainly on the horizontal bone augmentation. You place the titanium mesh, you place your graft material, and you fix the titanium with mini screws. Let me show you a small video. I hope this works fine. I hope you are seeing my screen now. I'll show okay. you a small we can, can yeah, you? we can see your uh, screens. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, I'll I'll have to mute uh, the the music, so I will not be hearing you until the video uh, ends. Okay. So, this is the double flap incision technique that starts with the split thickness. It starts with the splitting of the tissues into two layers, a double layer, an outer mucosal layer. As you can see, we are starting a, a split thickness incision and then an inner preosteal layer. Let me leave you a little bit with the, with the application of this technique. As you can see, it's a very tricky and technique sensitive procedure because you have to split the thickness of the soft tissue without any perforations and without any damage of this layer, which is very thin, especially with the bulge of the root of the neighboring tooth. So you go split thickness much like we do with the recession cases, root coverage cases, or any mucogingival uh, defects or mucogingival problems. Now what we are holding is the outer mucosal layer. We are splitting it. It will not be, be taking long. <clears throat> Of course, you have to be very careful with this splitting and you have to continuously hydrate your tissues so that it doesn't crack or uh, uh, no perforations occur while doing this split thickness. And now, as you can see in the video, we have the outer mucosal layer that I'm holding with the tissue forceps and the inner periosteal layer, which is still attached to the bone. You can see this is the inner periosteal layer and this is the outer mucosal layer. This technique guarantees that the, periosti the, the periosteum is intact and that the, blood, the uh, blood supply to the flap is less compromised. We continue splitting the outer layer with a sharp dissection, and then this is the inner layer separated alone. This is what we call the double flap incision technique. It was first proposed in 2013, I think. And then we elevate the inner periosteal layer with blunt dissection as usual, as we reflect any full thickness flap using the periosteal elevator. I want to show you the mental nerve. This is the mental nerve, this white small bundle here. This is the mental nerve. So you have to be very careful when you work in the posterior area. Actually, after doing 40 cases, I started to look for the mental nerve in the upper arch. <laughs> it was really something that was obsessing me all the time. Um, so now we are reflecting the inner periosteal layer and we have the two layers clear. As you can see, it's advised to do this technique with really thick phenotypes because if you have thin phenotype, it would be very challenging. And then we do what we call the decortication um, to enhance the blood supply for your graft material, of course, under copious irrigation. This is how the decortication looks like. It allows uh, the flow of the blood supply to the graft material, as we said. We can stop the video and I will continue with my case. I hope you can see it clearly now. Yeah, yeah, we can see everything. Okay. So, as we said, 
we apply the, the titanium mesh and the graft material, and then we start suturing the inner layer alone. As you can see, the inner layer is still tough and tight because it's not separated from the periosteum. And this periosteum is the reason why you cannot achieve primary closure with this extension. Imagine if this flap was all one piece, you will never achieve primary closure without doing something with the periosteum. So instead of doing the normal scoring or the fenestration of the periosteum that we do with the periosteal lesion incision, we separated the inner tough layer from the outer mucosal layer that is now free and that will actually attain the primary closure and will be sutured separately as an outer layer using silk or whatever uh, suture material you want. Of course, the inner suture material has to be resorbable. So this was Vicryl 6.0 because usually the periosteum is a very thin layer and you have to carefully manage it. So this is one way to do it. After six months, we can see that the soft tissue looks really good. There was no um, exposure of the titanium mesh in this case. Of course, we had exposures in other cases, but with the double flap, my experience with the double flap, the exposure was really minimum. Even when we had exposures, we had an exposure of the screw head or something, but never the large exposures that I used to see with the periosteal lasing incision. And of course, we all know that the titanium mesh is one of the membranes that has high exposure rates because of its nature, non-resorbable and tough nature. Here you can see the, the final outcome of the bone augmentation after six months. This is before and this is after. We gained around five millimeters at this area. We have now 9.7 while it was almost 4.5. So we have almost five millimeter of gain. And here we have almost 2.5 to 3 millimeters of gain at the most coronal part. After having the cone beam, we go back to remove our titanium mesh. And this is one of the pleasant moments, really. I'm kidding. It's not pleasant at all because the titanium mesh removal is really one of the tough procedures because it's usually integrated with the bone below it and integrated with the soft tissue above it. And you have this layer that you can call a pseudoperiosteal layer. It was well documented in the literature. Uh, because of the invasion of soft tissue from the flap to the inside or to the pores of the mesh itself. So usually the mesh is really integrated so hard with all the structure that is being, uh, with the coagulum and the, the structures that are being regenerated. So you remove the titanium mesh and then you place your implants. As you can see, we have a huge amount of bone that was very tough and very strong on drilling and it was uh, a, a successful case. We did the prosthetic part, but actually don't have the pictures of it. And you can think that, is it possible to graft the bone with the, just the xenograft, or do you need a combination of xenograft and... Doctor, uh, may I interrupt you and uh, sure. grab up um, what, uh, what we have just said? Uh, so uh, what you're saying that we actually uh, is... Uh, what we want to do with this technique is uh, to uh, to have the advantage of uh, primary closure. Uh, and the, the thing is, the thing about the periosteum is that the periosteum don't allow us uh, to perform this well. So what we need to do is to separate the soft tissue flap from the periosteum. So as the periosteum, which um, which is I want to say is tough enough, or it's tough. Uh, which doesn't allow us to uh, to, to, uh, to 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 do the primary closure. Uh, properly advanced. Yes, what, exactly. What I'm saying is right. Yes, exactly. Usually, what the gold standard technique is is to separate this periosteum from the inside of the flap. Imagine that you have the flap as one piece, a full thickness reflection. So the whole flap is really tough, and you cannot achieve primary closure. So usually, what you do is what we call periosteal fenestrations or periosteal leasing incision. You go to the inside of the flap, which is the periosteal layer, and you separate this flap by a fenestration at the base of this flap, and then the flap is free to move. But here, this modification was tested versus the periosteal leasing incision to avoid this periosteal uh, fenestration at the base of the flap, which may affect the blood supply and the exposure rates of such a challenging uh, membrane as the titanium mesh. Uh, what, what, what is the point of... Uh... Uh, using titanium I'm titanium, sorry, uh, I, I didn't get the question, sorry. What, why did you choose to use titanium membrane? Okay, uh, 
we used to uh, we we chose to use the titanium mesh because it's one of the challenging uh, membranes as we all know with documented high exposure rates in the lateral shift that could reach up to 50 or 55 percent of the cases so if you really want to test a flap uh, a modification of a flap technique you have to test it against a challenging membrane if you know what i mean if it's an you, you, mean, you mean for research reasons it's for research reasons Yes, this was my PhD. Yes, yeah, this was my PhD topic. And, and it's, it's very effective. So this technique is very effective uh, to achieve uh, closure of titanium, which is really, really a very famous uh, mesh, uh, membrane or mesh uh, for exposure. Yes, yes, exactly. But again, it's uh, only indicated for thick phenotype cases because if you do it with thin phenotype, most of the time you will get a very thin outer mucosal layer and maybe you will get uh, um, fenestrations of the flap or uh, I mean um, um, perforations or something. And you don't want to have a very thin flap so that you don't get necrosis. This is one thing. Yes. The other thing is that by the end of my work, my idea of tension differed because we what we usually did is that we put the flap and once it reaches the lingual part, we thought it's fine. But then with, with working a lot and with reading a lot about this, we actually discovered that there are signs to know that you actually don't have tension on your flap, which is two things. First, that it has to be advanced passively. I mean that you have to advance your flap against the lingual part or the crystal part. And then you pull your hands away. And if it stays there, then you don't have muscle push. If it goes back, then you, you still have tension and you still have a muscle pull and you still have to do either more fenestrations with the proselytizing incision or maybe more splitting with the double flap that we just explained. But this is a sign that your advancement is not enough and that you still have tension. If you, oh. if you pull the flap to the crest and then you remove your hands and find the flap is pulled back, then you still have tension. Yeah, I got it. So, this is what uh, yeah, I need to ask also, what about uh, the anterior region, especially in the maxilla? So is, the, is there any difference or the same same results? I actually tried this technique once with an upper uh, central case, which had good thickness, and this encouraged me to try it. Um, and it turned out the healing was uneventful, and it turned out to be right, uh, to be well, I mean. Um, so I would just recommend this technique anywhere in the oral cavity. We know that the lower posterior area is one of the challenging areas in terms of soft tissue thickness and uh, keratinized tissue height. Yeah. So if you can apply it with the lower anteriors, uh, with the lower posteriors, you can definitely do it with the maxilla uh, with better results because the maxilla usually have more keratinized tissue and better phenotype, mostly. Uh, it's about, it's not, it's not about the... Uh, this issue, the issue about the biotype, but anatomy of the anterior, uh, upper anterior is really challenging. So sometimes, especially in the ballot, uh, to, to do this with the ballot is really sometimes very challenging, especially when you, um, there is a lot of uh, bone defect and you need to apply a lot of bone in the anterior region. Mm -hmm. So sometimes uh, it's not an easy task to do. Usually the aesthetic zone is a, is a challenging zone, but I mean, usually we don't get the advancement from the palatal tissues. We usually get the advancement from the buccal tissues. So the palate is not really my issue when I'm talking about flap advancement. It's usually yeah. the buccal or labial tissues. So if you have... Um, you know, maybe, maybe I have uh, my own uh, reason to ask about this because I, I, I used to have a lot of failure with the titanium mesh in the anterior region. It's really, it was a uh, main and so it wasn't, it's really, it was not a good, um, it, it wasn't uh, not a good uh, modality with me. Yes. That's, maybe why I, that's why I'm asking you. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Maybe it's about the tension of the flap uh, or the, yeah, the, this is what I'm saying. And the, also, yeah, the, yeah. the muscles are hyper are hyperactive in the anterior region. Uh, sometimes uh, the soft tissue look like it's a good biotype, but when you uh, you do the flab and it's in your own hands, it's a different story. You, you find it is not like uh, as you imagined. Yes, of course, of course, I agree. And that's why we are trying to propose new uh, flap advancement techniques, maybe to overcome exposure problems with uh, with tough or big augmentations. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. So, what we are saying is, do we have to mix the xenograft with autogenous bone graft or autogenous particulate or not? 
right now i would go for mixing it or even layering it putting the the, the first layer of autogenous bone and then uh, uh, an overlying layer of xenograft or maybe mixing both like the boozer technique in burn do um but in, but in our uh, randomized clinical trial we used just the xenograft to avoid the morbidity of a second surgical site what i would recommend right now and i would prefer to do is using an auto chip maker there's this small burn that's called auto chip maker it goes with a low speed and then you can drill much like the trifine burn but it comes out with uh, the bone already crushed and then you can get your graft without having to open a second surgical site, maybe from the ramus or from the symphysis area and so on. And we're going to see the next case that we did the blood graft. And uh, Sorry, doctor, we have a question here. Sure, uh, sure. It's from Alia Usama Mahmoud El Menufi, and she's she's asking about only xenograft granules I load under the titanium mesh or blocks. Yes, yes. This is what I was saying in this slide only used xenograft and we didn't use a mixture of xenograft and autograft uh, i mean uh, she, maybe she's not asking about the study she's asking in general can we do uh add blocks under the titanium mesh blocks block you mean? or bone block bone blocks can we use bone blocks under the titanium mesh i think what she's asking about that yes okay I have never seen a bone block under titanium mesh because the whole point of titanium mesh is to be space making. So usually yeah, it's, it's pointless. Do, it's, a, it's it's possible, but it's pointless. Yes, and I actually I've never seen it done in the literature. I never read something about this. Usually, what you do with the block, as we're going to explain in the next case, is that you you just place the block, and if you are concerned about the resorption of the block or something, you may use a collagen membrane just for protection or maybe some particulate overlying but you don't have to use something as tough and space making as the titanium mesh if you're going because again if you think about it this will make a huge augmentation area imagine putting a block and then covering it with titanium mesh you will never have enough soft tissue to close above everything yeah so no um, i never see titanium mesh with a block if you use a block you just put the block alone and maybe uh, put some particulate xenograft or alloplast or whatever overlying it like the case we're going to see right now yeah. Did I answer? Yes, yes, sure Okay Let's think about the alternatives of this case I mean, we managed this case this way because this was part of my thesis and the cases we were looking for but what about other techniques that we could use for horizontal augmentation if you think of splitting or you think of bone expansion you have to look at something that's really important the thickness of this cortical plate you can see here that we have a very thick cortical plate of course we're in the posterior mandible which which usually have thick cortical part so that's why sometimes we are limited in this zone to avoid some techniques to avoid necrosis of the bone because as we all know the spongy bone is the part that usually has the blood supply and the osteoblasts and is more flexible in terms of nature while the cortical part is the tough part that usually does not have enough blood supply so if you go for expansion here or maybe splitting you may expect that the, the, the part that you are squeezing will end up with necrosis so whenever we are choosing something like splitting or expansion, uh, we have to put an eye on the thickness of the cortical plate. If you have enough spongy bone in between the two plates, minimum two to three millimeters, then you can go for expansion and the ridge, the outer part, the cortical part of the ridge will actually expand with you and you can place your implant safely. But if you go for expansion or splitting while you have that thick cortical plate, you may end up with bone resorption and the cruises of this fractured part. Okay, do we have any questions about the first case? Yeah, I have a question. Um, I'd like to ask, what do you think about uh, osteodensification? Yes, this is what I meant by expansion. I wouldn't recommend osteodensification in such a case because the idea of osteodensification depends on the expansion of this outer plate. And again, as I although, said, although it's, uh, uh, I know that the cortical bit are a little bit wide here, but it's according to them, it's a pyramidal in shape. Uh, there is a lot of uh, 
uh, I mean, uh, cancellous bone. So it's an ideal case for osteoclastification. We, according, we to, actually, according to, not according to me, it's according to the, the technique, uh, the, the doctor who made this technique, I mean. Yes, usually they recommend enough spongy bone or enough... Uh, which enough is available here. Yes, I know, uh, which uh, is available here. It's really not available here. If you can see, we have a very thick cortical plate here and a very thick cortical plate here. And this part is only spongy. It's, it's almost one millimeter or less. So I wouldn't recommend doing this because we may end up with necrosis of the cortical plate that is really avascular. Okay. I would recommend it with wider uh, amount or bigger amount of buccolingual sponge bone. Okay. So the second case we're going to discuss uh, is a case that, again, if you look clinically, it may be looking fine. You can find here that you don't have that huge buccal depression labially, so maybe things look okay. But then when you go for a cooking, you find that you don't have enough bone at all. You only have two point, almost 2.5 millimeters of bone. And of course, because this is an upper anterior area, we are now thinking about the cortical plate. It's very thin cortical plate and enough spongy bone, but still this is not enough for splitting or expansion because you only have 2.5 millimeters. So usually with, especially, it's not just the crest apart, it's the whole ridge. The whole ridge is really thin. So this is a challenging case. We, we can think of as a challenging case. What we proposed here was uh, a bone block from the ramus. This is our flap reflection and the decortication, as we mentioned before. And then this is the depression here in the occlusal view, you can see that the ridge is really thin and you have a huge depression. Of course, this happens with traumatic extractions. The more traumatic you extract the tooth, the more bone that you lose, especially if the buccal plate was really thin. <clears throat> so we went for the ramus and we got the block and we placed the block in the, in the, in the part that was deficient, the part with the, with the most bone uh, loss. And here I have a trick to say, I'm not an expert with blocks because I'm a periodontist. So I just did two or three cases for uh, the knowledge of the technique. But here I would like to recommend something that when we do the drilling for this screw, it has to be a little bit wider than the size of the screw itself. Sorry. So that the screw goes passively through the block and then penetrates the autogenous bone underlying. Because if the size of the drill is really the exact size of the of the screw, this block may uh, fracture with the pressure of screwing it in. So this is really a very important tip. I have seen I have seen blocks fracture with some friends. So you really don't like to <laughs> don't like to have that, especially that you uh, obtain the block after a huge amount of work. So to preserve your block, you have to make the the hole of the drill a little bit wider to avoid fracture of the plate. We, and this may answer the question uh, of the block and titanium mesh. Here we put the block and then we, uh, to, to avoid the resorption of the block, the rapid resorption of the block, we protected it with some xenograft material overlying and of course to give some contouring too. And this is the flap closure. After six months, the soft tissue looked well. There was no fenestrations or exposures. As you can see that we don't have the depression that we had before. The soft tissue looks fine. We have enough keratinized tissue and we have a good buccal contouring of the soft tissue and of the bone, of course. And then when you open, you can compare the pre and post situation. You can see here that this is the depression and this is the block. And you have some filling here and you can compare it with the, with the screw head. This is before and this is after. Actually, when you look at this cone beam, you are really not sure if the block is really integrated with the autogenous bone or not. So I remember that when I saw this cone beam, I sent it to my professor, Dr. Hany Nahas, my supervisor. And then I asked him, doctor, do you think this graft is not integrated? He just told me you have to open up and see. You can never tell from the cone beam. But actually what happened is that when we opened, it was well integrated and it was nice. And there's no problem with the drilling or anything. And you can see here the buccal contouring and the amount of gain we had. 
if I would recommend something in this case, I would recommend putting the block a little bit more chronal. If you see the position of the block, I would put it more chronal because this is the part you are concerned about, the crested yeah. part, the thinnest part, and this is the part you are concerned about. So if I go back again, I or, or in, in my next cases, we could put the graft more chronal to gain more uh, bone crestally, which is your area of interest. Uh, and there is uh, any photos for uh, for the prosthesis? No, not yet. We are we we don't have it because uh, you know we've been home for five six months now, so we are mm -hmm. really waiting for the prosthetic part. Okay, great. Okay, the third piece we are going to discuss. Do you have any questions so far, or should I go on? No, nothing. Uh, uh, most of the people are just, uh, uh, they are they like the presentation and um, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, it's just great. In. This is good to know. Thank you. All. Uh, no. um, so the third case is a case I personally like because it, uh, it, was, it, it had a lot of interventions for me as an implantologist and also as a periodontist. When you have multiple problems, when you look at this case, you can see that she has the missing upper left premolars, the four and the five. And she has, of course, a gummy smile and very short clinical crowns. And of course, we have an inflammation related to this crown here. You can see it's a localized problem. So you think it's probably related to this defective crown, maybe violation of biological width, or maybe an open contact, uh, an, open, um, an open margin of the finish line or something. And we have, of course, uh, the Dr. Uh, I have a question here. Sure. Uh, it's from Dr. Knighton Francis. Um, he, was, he or she is uh, asking, how would you compare bone blocks to Hori blades? Hori blades. Yeah, I was going to talk about this. I really don't have any experience with Hori. I never did it before. I attended a lot of uh, presentations and talks about it. Um, Everyone seems to like it so much because there is the gap between the plate and the autogenous bone and you fill this gap with a lot of uh, graft material and you gain a lot of bone. But I really don't have an, a clinical experience about it, so I cannot uh, tell you my opinion about it because I never did both of them. Yeah, well, I would tell, I would tell her it's very, very technique sensitive. Uh, yeah, it's not sure. an easy uh, technique at all, especially for... Uh, not trained or not well trained uh, subject, um, uh, and uh, no, it cannot it cannot be controlled. It's a different story, and uh, uh, in my opinion, it's not that easy at all. It's not easy at all. I totally agree. You have to train a lot about it, and you have maybe yeah. to get a, a course. Need or a, a lot of experience. Also, most of the time, it's not easy at all to split the plate, uh, the yeah. bone bone block. I mean. Yes, but the ones oh, actually wow. it are, are very enthusiastic about it and they like it so much. Maybe when you do it well, you like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, yeah. still, there is a lot of exposure. There is a lot of, uh, you, you would need a lot of soft tissue. Uh, mm -hmm. You need a lot of experience. You need a, a good bone block to do that. And you need uh, armamentarium, a good armamentarium and a very mm -hmm. good experience. Yes, of course, I agree. So, uh, again, back to our case, as I was just telling you, it's, it, was, it has mul a multiple disciplinary approach with a short clinical crown, with the missing teeth and implants, and with this frenum. It's not just a frenum, it's called a trifid frenum. A trifid frenum, which means it has three muscle attachments or three uh, insertions, three inser inserting parts of the muscle. This frenum is really not very common to see. It's really muscular and it's highly attached. And of course, it was uh, contributing to this diastema and the insertion was really uh, strong. So we have those three problems or maybe four problems concerning this defective crown to manage. This patient, let me tell you before we start discussing the case, it's really important to know your patient and to know who you are talking to and what is she expecting and how far is she willing to go. This patient was demanding, but still very skeptic. She was skeptic about every treatment plan we proposed. She was not sure she's going to get the results she wants. She was very afraid to take risks. So I had to go step by step with her and um, 
the, the treatment plan was, as I'm going to propose right now, was to do laminates for the interior area. But at the end of the of the treatment plan, she decided that she will stop like like this. She will stop here and she will not uh, continue the laminates or the restorative part. So let's think of the sequence of treatment. You have missing upper premolars, you have short clinical crowns, and you have a huge muscular frenum. What would you begin with? What's the the what's the most one that needs time for healing? Of course, it's your implants because you need to put the implants and you need to give it time for osteointegration. Although we have publications that tell you that you can load after two months, maybe after six weeks with some implant brands, but still with my population, especially with the cases done in the university and with the population we see with mostly deficiency of vitamin D and deficiency of calcium and malnutrition and not that good hygiene, I would like to wait enough to make sure that those implants are osteointegrated. So for me, the longest treatment plan is uh, the implant treatment plan. So we started with the implant insertion first, and then we did the freedom to be able to do the aesthetic crown entry. Let's see how it goes. First, we, we did the cone beam for the premolar areas. And here you can find that we have uh, the crest apart 4.4, 4.5, and 6.5 more epically. But let me tell you something. Before, maybe two or three years ago or more, we used to look at the comb beam and say, yes, this bone looks fine. Yes, we don't need augmentation. Yes, we can go for straightforward implants. But then when you read or, or you get more knowledge about prosthetically driven implant placement, you don't depend on the comb beam alone. You have to check your clinical view. Because maybe you have enough bone buccolingually, but you have to place the implants too palatally. And it would be impossible to restore if you don't place your implants prosthetically driven. As you can see in this case, the cone beam looked fine. We had the, something that looked like enough bone in some areas. But then when you look clinically, you'll find a huge buccal depression. And this means that I don't go bone driven. I don't follow the bone. I follow the future crowns. So in this case, we, we knew that we will have a bone defect buccally, a fenestration or a dehiscence or maybe just a crack. And we were preparing the xenograft and the collagen membrane on the table to do simultaneous augmentation with those implants. So we started with the full thickness crystal incision regularly. And then we opened the flap. You can see the reflection of this buccal depression here. You have the buccal depression uh, in the bone. And this is what we call attraction suture. We like to do it so that the palatal flap is reflected without inserting, inserting an instrument and making your assistant busy with reflecting the palatal flap. Maybe it slips while working. So we do the attraction suture at the beginning of the surgery and it stays there until you finish. It makes things a little bit simple. So we placed the two premolars, the four and the five. And as you can notice here, we have the crack that we expected to happen. And we have thin bone overlying this premolar. Let's think, what's, what's thin? How much can you go? What's the minimum that you need buckle to an implant? What we know for sure right now from the evidence that you need a minimum of 1.5 to 2 millimeters of buckle bone or of bone buckle to your implant in order to guarantee that this bone will stay, that there will be no necrosis and resorption in the future. So if you have less than 1.5 millimeters of bone, you have to go for augmentation for two reasons, for simultaneous augmentation, I mean, for two reasons. The first reason is to prevent bone resorption of the buccal uh, bone or, or the bone buccal to your implant. And the second reason is for aesthetic purpose, for contouring of the bone, labia to the implant and avoiding the buccal depression that we see usually with implants uh, placed in thin bone especially if you're talking about an aesthetic zone. So what we did was, again, the graft material and the membrane overlying. This was just for the picture. And then we wetted the membrane with saline to cover, of course, the buccal flap, the buccal uh, bone graft. And then the suturing regularly. And this was it for the implant placement. We then left it to heal and we continued our treatment plan during the osteointegration phase of those implants. 
the technique we did for the management of this frenum is called phrenotomy and not phrenectomy. Phrenotomy means phrenal relocation, and it's a partial thickness procedure that is not mentioned so much in the literature, except perhaps in the book uh, Cohen's Atlas of Plastic Periodontal Surgery, 2007. He mentioned it in a small line in a paragraph, and he even didn't put pictures of the technique. But I owe Dr. Haney knowing this technique and doing it. And actually, we are now conducting conducting a randomized clinical trial comparing the frontomy versus the usual phrenectomy that we know. We are proposing that this technique results in less pain and less scar formation and better healing for the patient. I'm going to uh, explain how it goes. This freedom, as we said, is really challenging. When you open a flap partial thickness, you can see the reflection of the trifid freedom here. You can see the three insertions, strong and, and high insertions of the muscle. So we go partial thickness, a C shape like this, and a C shape like this, and join the two uh, incisions together in a partial thickness manner. Once you join them, you see this. You can see the muscle insertion uh, very clear and very strong. Then we go for blunt dissection. We get the periosteal elevator, and we start to relocate this muscle to an apical level, push this muscle more apically, until you get this. Here, you cannot see the strong muscle attachments that we had when we began the, uh, began the surgery. And then you go for a step called undermining, also with blunt dissection, which denotes separation of the overlying epithelium from the underlying connective tissue or labial mucosa in order to be able to suture without tension with the lip movement uh, to, to avoid the uh, uh, tearing of the sutures. And then we go for three periosteal sutures, the suture, the epithelium in the periosteum, here in the midline, and then the epithelium in the periosteum on the right side, and the epithelium in the periosteum on the left side, and you leave this to heal with secondary intention. I know this may look terrifying for some people, they may say, how can you leave such a bare area? But remember that we started with the partial thickness procedure. We don't have exposed bone, so it's not a problem at all. It's even more simple and less painful than an extraction socket. And this is what you get after two weeks with the secondary intention. And actually, from the patients I have seen so far, the, the pain score is really minimum with this technique. We, co we are comparing the pain score in the front me versus, versus the phrenectomy, and we are getting an excellent feedback from the patients in terms of patient morbidity. So this is the freedom before and after. You can see here after six months. This is a picture after six months. You can see the amount of... Uh, relocation that we had and now the frenum does not represent any problem for you because usually this frenum even after treating it with a phrenectomy will cause i'm not sure it will but most probably it causes uh, a huge scar in the middle of uh, the papilla uh, along the incision line of the phrenectomy so here if even if you have a scar you have a small scar at the very apical part that's not visible by the patient or by anyone so this is what we did for the freedom. And lastly, you can see here. Um, before, we, uh, before we proceed. Uh, um, sure. I can hear you, doctor. Do you have a question? Am I still here? I really don't know. I lost you. Okay, so I, I will I will go on until you come back because I cannot hear you right now. Am I having a problem? No, I'm not having a problem. Okay, Dr. Mohammed, I will continue my presentation if you can hear me until you come back because I cannot hear you now. So what we have right now, as you can see here, is a minimum scar formation after the phrenotomy procedure, after two months or eight weeks. And you can see that the freedom does not represent a problem for you anymore. And you can start with your aesthetic crown lengthening, avoiding the freedom pool that was here. And you can see that we don't have a huge scar in between the centuries. 
I just want to make sure that the presentation is still working. Are we still on? Okay, so I should go on. I'm sorry, I'm going to share again. Um, okay. Okay. I hope you can see the screen right now. I lost Dr. Muhammad for some reason. Okay. So what we were saying is that after the phrenotomy or the free relocation, you can see that we, that we have minimum scar formation and that we now have enough space and enough creatinized tissue, of course, to perform our aesthetic crown lengthening procedure. I don't like to do bleeding points I like to do uh, an exact drawing of the margin of, of my future gingival margin or of the margin I'm desiring to do. So we do our markings. Of course, we, we can have a long presentation about aesthetic crown lengthening. I will not waste time with this right now. Maybe we can, uh, we can have another session and talk about how we identify our points and our margin. And then here we raise the flap to see the level of the bone. You can see here that the crown is very close vertically to the crest of the bone. And this is a clear violation of biological width. And this what was causing the, uh, the continuous inflammation related to the crown in this tooth. And you can also notice an open margin here that the fringe line is directed with the crown. Um, on the other side, you can see that the uh, sorry, doc sorry, Doctor Nada, for that interruption. It's, uh, it's in, from my side. Uh, now uh, everybody can see your presentation. It, uh, it was disturbed for a little moment. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah. It, it, no, no. Everybody, everybody uh, could hear you, but they didn't see the presentation. Uh, okay. Anyway, uh, can we just uh, go back for some slides to the difference between phrenectomy and phrenotomy? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we in in, in Anshams University, uh, we uh, we are used to uh, to uh, to have this uh, question in the oral exam about what is the difference between phrenectomy and phrenotomy. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but uh, it's the same. Uh, we we used to say that the difference is in phrenect in phrenotomy. We we remove we remove the connection of the muscle, as you say, and uh, we undermine uh, we undermine uh, the epithelium. But uh, the 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 only difference uh, between us and you uh, was this secondary intention, which I mean, uh, which I'm saying about, which I'm talk I'm talking about uh, um, suturing the epithelium with the briosteum uh, to to prevent epithelium uh, cover cover the defect. This is new for me, but uh, it's really nice. Thank so you. this uh, this is the only interruption I would I would do for now. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, okay. So I was I was saying when, when you left, I was saying that we can now see that we have minimum scar formation with this technique and that even if you have any disturbance, it would be very apical and away from your area of concern or of your aesthetic zone. Um, and again, here we can see that there is no uh, scar formation at all. There is no uh, evidence that we even did anything here. And I was just explaining that we have a lot to talk about concerning aesthetic crown lengthening and how we do the measurements, but we will not do that now because it will be a very long presentation to do. Um, and I was saying that I like to put the marks with a pen and not with bleeding points in order to be able to draw exactly what I want to do. And here we did our incisions and we raised the flap. And as you can see here, 
we have a violation, a clear violation of the biological wax because the crown margin is so close to the bone. You can see this is almost one millimeter, and usually we need about 2.5 millimeters between the, the crown margin and the crest of the bone or any final restriction you are placing in order to preserve the biological wax, the epithelium and the connective tissue, or what we call in the new classification the supracrystal soft tissue. You can also notice that you have an open margin actually. The, the finch line is the, 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 the crown is not really adapted on the finch line. And those both facts cause the continuous inflammation with this crown. So um, maybe we can tell our friends in the prosthetic department whenever you are going to place a crown subgingivally for uh, maybe fracture reason, caries reason, or maybe for aesthetic reasons, you have to probe to know your sulcus depth and to know actually where is the bone so that you avoid violation and inflammation around uh, of the margin around your restoration. On the other side, you can see that also the bone is almost on the cement enamel junction or maybe one millimeter apical, which was not enough. So we did bone removal on both sides, which is, which is what we call osteectomy. And there's a difference between osteectomy and, os uh, and osteoplasty. Osteectomy means that we actually remove the bone in a vertical dimension in order to preserve around two millimeters between the cemento enamel junction and the crest of the bone, and here two to 2.5 millimeters between the crown margin and the crest of the bone. Osteoplasty denotes the reshaping of the bone bulging, which sometimes you have to do uh, to avoid um, the lip tension, perhaps, or to get better aesthetics with aesthetic crown length. Here we decided to keep the mesial papilla, although it looks long, but actually we had, the patient had this concern and I also agreed with it, that if we cut this papilla shorter, the diastema will be more prominent and she didn't really like this and she was really concerned about this. So we decided to leave the, the, mesial, the mid papilla uh, without uh, reshaping or cutting it. And then the technique that we used here, the suturing technique is called uh, internal vertical mattress in order to preserve the papilla in place. Again, we can go in another session with all the details about aesthetic crown lengthening and about its suturing, but I will move forward now in order to see all the cases. So this is the baseline smile that we had, and this is the final outcome. We still have inflammation related to the lateral. It was recommended that we change the restoration and we do laminates for everything. But as I was telling you in the beginning of this uh, case, that the patient was very skeptic and she wanted to stop at this point. And the other side with the crowns of the implants in place. So this was our third case for today. I can welcome any questions if you want, or should I just go on? Uh, well, um... Uh, there is uh, if if anybody has any question uh, if anybody have any question it's uh, more than welcome yeah. okay no, no no nothing I cannot see uh, I cannot see uh, read any questions so it's all about uh, thanking you and this and that thank you thank you so much. okay the fourth case that we have here is a case of multiple implants and actually especially with the, with the fresh graduates that are so enthusiastic to work and put as many implants as they can, they can think of this as a simple case. However, we all know that multiple neighboring implants, more than two or three teeth, is really a challenging thing to, uh, to do, especially if you want to do it with a correct prosthetically driven position and with good parallelism and with everything going fine without the need for maybe angulated abutments or maybe impinging of the soft tissue or the bone in between and so on. So here we had a case with three missing neighboring teeth, four, five, six. And we have to think of the first step. What's the first step that we need to do? Because usually what happens is that everyone runs to do the cone beam and they come to me and say, we have the cone beam and we have the patient and let's proceed. And I actually always tell everybody that we need to see the patient first we need to do the talking and discuss the treatment plan, and then we can go for the combi. And this is actually, of course, for a personal reason and for communication reasons, but also for technical reasons. Because if you take the comb beam like this, you will not be able to know anything. The data you will have will be really missing because you need to place three implants, but you don't know where exactly is each implant going to be placed especially if you're working freehand and not with a guide. 
Ideally speaking, we would do this with a surgical guide, a fully guided surgery. But we all know that not everybody is comfortable with doing this and that this is an extra cost and extra time for the patient. And maybe it's still not uh, our routine practice here in Egypt. So we can do something in between the freehand and the guided surgery. As you can notice here, you can see some marks that we really don't know what is this, right? Something that's straight to radio pick on the x-ray. What we really do is that we put uh, the, the teeth that we want to replace with very simple acrylic teeth and wax uh, and wax cementation. We, we fix the teeth with uh, wax or any sticky material. And then we do a thermopress or uh, a stent on these teeth. And we simply glue some gutta perca exactly in the middle portion of each tooth that we want to replace. This is a very simple and cheap step to do. And, and actually, it's not a hassle not to do it. I mean, uh, it's not something that's really costly or time uh, consuming or exhausting for you or for the patient, but still it will give you amazing results with your parallelism and with your positioning. So I would like to call it a semi-guided thing. A semi-guided placement, especially with all the teeth missing. And then you, you uh, do uh, some occlusal holes in the middle of the three, the three teeth you want to place. And you can see here the gutta perca on the buccal surface. And you can use this for your, not the pilot drill, just the initial point that you put for before uh, continuing your drill. Uh, as you can I, see I, here. I saw something similar to this, but um, uh, instead of using uh, uh, the gutta percha, they, they, uh, they were using uh, barium. You know the barium meal? They, they use the liquid of the barium. Yeah. The barium sulfate. Yeah. It's the same idea. Sometimes they construct the whole thing, the whole crown with barium sulfate. It's the same idea. Anything that can be really opaque. But if you think about it, nothing can be more simple and cheap than just gluing a gutta perca on the acrylic stent. Yeah. It's just an indication where you are. So now you can see this mark and you can see that this exactly is where I'm, go I'm going to place my four, my premolar. And this is exactly where I'm going to place my five. And this is exactly where I'm going to place my six. And then you can have accurate measurements of the, the, of the implants you want to place. And of course, of the position during the surgery. So as you can see, you can place your three implants with good parallelism, with good mesiodistal uh, spaces and with good somehow buccolingual position. Here in the middle implant, we had a uh, fenestration defect and very thin bone on the crystal part and a crack here. We also knew that this would, ha would happen from the x-ray. So we prepared our graft material and collagen membrane and we placed the graft and the collagen and we sutured it. And then we opened after six months for the prosthetic part. Unfortunately, for most of the cases, I don't have my uh, my crowns, but I will make sure to get the pictures because usually the, the prosthetic department continues the work. So let's think about the options of replacing three missing teeth. And this was one of the presentations we did in our education club. Uh, one of my brilliant students is called Saleh. Ahmad Saleh, uh, who, he was the one who presented it. And it was com comparing if you place three neighboring implants with separate crowns, and they called it non-splinted crowns, or three neighboring implants with splinted crowns, or an implant-supported bridge. And they compared the results of those three treatment modalities. This paper was published in 2019, and it was really well conducted. And this is a screenshot from his presentation, presenting the results of this paper. We found that everything was better with the implant-supported bridge, surprisingly. We always thought that placing uh, uh, one tooth, one implant per each, per each tooth would be the best treatment option. However, we got better survival rates, better success rates, less pre-implantitis rates, and less prosthetic complications, and of course, less cost with the implant-supported bridge. So, so, we so this, this study is telling us that uh, implants like to be uh, far from each other. They don't like to be... Uh, exactly. <laughs> Yes, yes. And the, yes, exactly. And their justification was that in spite 
the bridge has a bendability. Uh, uh, يعني, I mean, it's, it's, it's moving because it's a bridge at the end of the day. It's not a single crown. So in spite of this bendability, yet we had better results because we had less rough surfaces. This was their highlight conclusion, that you have less rough surfaces and that the middle implant, if you put three neighboring implants, the middle implant is the most implant at risk of developing peri-implantitis due to the rough surface and the threads of the implant. So um, actually, if I think about it as a clinician or maybe as a patient, I would still be concerned about the fluffing and I would still love to have each uh, implant separately done. But what we know for sure is that we would never go for three neighboring splinted implants because we got the worst results with the splinted group. We can go for implant supported bridge or non splinted crowns. This was a very nice. Uh, it's so a then, very uh, it's very smart idea to be honest. It's a very it's a very smart idea. The the the, 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 the question this research is uh, answering is uh, yes. interesting. Yes, exactly. I agree. Okay. So case number five and six are basically addressed the. the deficiency with uh, height of the bone. We talked about thin ridges and about horizontal deficiencies, and now we are going to address vertical deficiencies. So what if you don't have enough height of bone, especially in the posterior area where you have the maxillary sinus pneumatization, so maybe you don't have enough vertical bone. Of course, with the, with the lower posterior, it's more challenging and you can go for short uh, implants, but the short implants and the upper posterior is really still an area of research. So sinus lifting, either internal or external, as we're going to address, is still an option of treatment. It's still on the table. So here we have a height of 9.2, maybe less, because uh, after I put the screenshot, I found that I measured a little bit more. So this is perhaps 8.9 or 9 millimeters of height. Usually, you need to put a regular implant of 10 millimeters and you need two millimeters of uh, safety margin between your implant and the vital structure. So if you're going to place a 10 millimeter implant, you need a minimum of 12 millimeters. This is not really a huge vertical deficiency. So you can go for what we call internal sinus problem, uh, internal, sorry, not problem, <laughs> internal sinus lifting or crestal approach. So what you do is you do the drilling around 1.5 to 2 millimeters shorter than your sinus floor. In case you are a beginner and it's your first time, I would recommend a minimum of 2 millimeters safety margin because you are not very sure where your, drilling, your drill is stopping. And sometimes even if it's your first case, we put like uh, the stopper of the file, we put it with the drill so, so, so that it doesn't slip. Once the stopper touches the crest of the bone, you just go out. So if it's your first case, you have to be very careful and you have to leave a minimum of two millimeters safety margin between your drill and the sinus floor. So if you are talking about nine millimeters here, so you're going to drill seven millimeters uh, length. And then- uh, uh, Sorry, doctor, uh, there is a question from Dr. Nathan Francis. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, uh, so it's about uh, for just a second for implants on anterior uh, for implants on anterior with high frenal attachment. Would you recommend phrenectomy prior to or during implant placement? Okay, if it's a high frenum and you're going to implant, you have to think actually what's your problem with the frenum? Is it the pull? of the flap itself, or maybe the aesthetics of your soft tissue margin, I really have to address each case by case, because sometimes we have high frenum attachment that we release during the implant insertion from the inner part of the flap, and that's it. And sometimes we have implant, we have frenum attachments that actually hinder your flap reflection. So according to the nature of the frenum, if it's muscular or mucosal, and according to the level of attachment, uh, is it so high that you cannot raise a flap with its presence or not? If it's really a dense frenum like the one we have seen, because you, you can have a trifid frenum like what we saw or a bifid frenum, sometimes it's two insertions, I would go, I would go for doing it separate procedure, especially if I'm going to do a big augmentation to avoit tension uh, on my flap during uh, suturing. 
But if it's a really thin frenum that's not that's mucosal and not really causing tension, maybe you can just release it from the inside of the flap during your uh, placement. So I would Im I would imagine that what you're saying uh, that in, if the frenum attachment is high and it will you expect that it will create a problem for the soft tissue in the prosthetic uh, stage, you have to do it before before inserting the implant yes or even with the flap reflection in the surgery or, or during the surgery or during yes. the surgery not in a yes. separate yes. surgery but exactly. unless uh if it is not you know you are not expecting to have a big deal with this high freedom attachment it's not recommended to do anything just leave it sometimes you just leave it yes sometimes you have a thin uh, mucosal freedom that is very inserted but not causing any tension so you just leave it <laughs> Now uh, we hope we had uh, answered your question, Dr. Nitt. Thank you. Oh. Thank you for attending everything, Nitin, really. And yeah. I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly. So I think it's not, it's not, not, not Nitin or something like that. But it's Francis. Nitin it's Francis, yeah. He is one of the education club members that is actually very active and very team. Okay. Okay. So again, I was saying that if uh, you are still a beginner and maybe not like you are a young clinician, I mean beginner with this technique, maybe it's your first time to do it, even if you placed a lot of implants, we can uh, go for a two millimeter safety margin and then you stop. And then you use the osteotones, what, what we call the osteotones, that has marks here and you can uh, adjust this stopper on the length of the implants you're going to place. Usually it's a 10 millimeter implant and you go inside of this osteotomy with the osteotome and you start hammering on this uh, osteotome with the mallet. And then you achieve the length you want and then you place the implant regularly like any regular implant you, you place. I so, think this, uh, is, uh, this is called summer technique. Yes, it's, uh, it was summer 1994. He actually addressed both techniques, the crystal and the, the, yeah. the lateral. Uh, so, like, uh, uh, yeah. uh, so this is the crystal approach whenever you have enough vertical bone to do it. Sometimes, in, in, especially in this case, like this case, you don't, have, you, you don't have enough vertical height to do the crystal approach. Like in this case, we only have around 3.5 millimeters of height. Three millimeters or, or four millimeters of height is not enough to do the, the crystal approach. So sometimes we go for the lateral approach. This patient was actually a friend of mine. So we discussed the options. We discussed putting two implants, inserting two implants in the four and the five area and maybe cantilever of the six, which I didn't recommend. I was a bit uh, unsure and, and not confident to do this because we all know that the prognosis of the cantilever uh, bridges is less and the survival rate is less. Let alone that this is the six. It's it's the it's the six. It's the the occlusion. The whole occlusion is functioning on this tooth. So I was not very comfortable. I, with I, doing I think you say you say you are saying that uh, biomechanically it's not accepted. Yes, exactly. In terms of prosthetic failure, in terms of uh, resorption, bone resorption around the two implants are going to place. Sometimes we go for cantilevers with the the most distal tooth, but with more implants, more than two implants. You increase the number of implants to avoid the cantilever uh, damages. So I told him that this is a less invasive option. And we have the more invasive option of the external or lateral approach sinus lifting. And I explained the procedure and he decided to go for the external sinus lifting. So what we did was a full thickness crystal incision and the full thickness vertical incision, of course, mesial. And then we did our measurements with the four millimeters that we had. And then we started our uh, osteotomy. We started to, to, to prepare the window, as you can see here. And then using the sinus elevator, uh, the sinus elevators, we elevated this part to um, a more coronal level, a more apical level, sorry. And here I want you to notice this small bleeder because you don't want to injure this bleeder. 
because you may get a bleeding that you cannot control. So you have to uh, be very careful in the flap reflection to locate this artery in order to avoid injury. And then we placed the, our first collagen membrane, the apical collagen membrane, and then we tucked in the bone. It was purely xenograft. And then we did some contour augmentation on the outer part. This was an allograft. And then we placed the collagen membrane on top of it. And then we took it. Actually, we still don't have, we did not proceed with, with the prosthetic part because also of the conditions that we have, but we had the post-op cone beam. It was, I think, eight months post-operatively. And you can see here the, uh, the huge amount of bone gain. Of course, you may think, why didn't you elevate everything and gain bone even in the mesial part? Because here we might need some uh, crystal sinus lifting or internal sinus lifting with a crystal approach. But we also discussed this because if we were going to elevate this part too, it was going to be a huge lateral window. And the morbidity would be very big. So we decided to go for augmenting the posterior part. And then at the time of implant placement, we're going to elevate uh, internally the mesial part, which is uh, really a less invasive approach to do. He already suffered a lot after the surgery. And this is the buccolingual view. You can see here that we have almost 15 millimeters. This is more than you need. I'm still waiting for the implant insertion and the prosthetic part. Case number seven is actually uh, a case I'm very enthusiastic to show you because it addresses a very critical uh, issue, which is the soft tissue and the papilla around implants. Do you have any questions before I start this one? No, we are good. Great. This is the last case I'm going to discuss today. And it's uh, about soft tissue dehiscence around implants. So I had this case. We, we actually did it in uh, the Cairo University, the Faculty of Dentistry, Cairo University, during my PhD time there. It was referred from a colleague from the prosthetic department. They came and told me, we really don't know what to do. We have this, and we really don't know how to manage this. Um, and of course, it looked bad. It looked ugly. They tried to make the crown wider in order to minimize this black triangle. But of course, you have discrepancy of the margin and you have this black triangle here and you have this black triangle here and the patient was not satisfied and they were not satisfied because it was part of the requirements. So everyone was really not happy. They tried to do something with the pink porcelain, but still they, they were not happy about the results and the patient was still not satisfied. And of course you can tell that this mesial part, the crown is very wide. So whenever we talk about pre-implant dehiscence, we have to mention the amazing work that was done by the Bologna group, the Zucchelli group. And we actually had the Dr. Martina Stefanini in our education club two weeks ago, exactly discussing and explaining this very specific issue of the new classification that was proposed for peri-implant dehiscence. I would recommend reading this paper for anyone who is working with implants and who is keen to achieve good soft tissue results around implants because we all face peri-implant defects. We all have cases that are either referred to us or maybe our cases may end up with uh, soft tissue dehiscence defects or maybe papilla loss around the implants. And it's really a very sensitive and common issue to, uh, to face. So what they did, I will, I will talk about this very briefly because this is a very long presentation. I will just address the, the, the main points in it. You have to look occlusally at your crown. If your crown is inside of the envelope, what's the envelope? The envelope is the line between the two neighboring teeth. This straight line. If the crown is inside this envelope, then it's either cross one or two. If the crown is outside this line, then we have to remove the crown and see how to manage it. So first, if you have the crown that's bulging outside the envelope, it's either the margins are equal and you just have a problem with discoloration, and here they will call it a class one, or you have a discrepancy in the margin, and here they will call it class two. Let's say this slowly again. 
First of all, we look at the occlusal view. We look at the crown. If the crown is inside the implant, the, the neighboring, the envelope of the neighboring teeth or the contour of the neighboring teeth, <clears throat> then you look at the level of the margin. If the level of the margin is equal to the neighboring natural, then it's a class one. And your only problem is with discoloration or metal shadow or metal display. If the margin is more than natural neighboring, then it's a class two. Okay, what if we have the crown bulging outside? We have to remove the crown and then decide. If the implant itself is correctly positioned and the problem is with the crown, then this is a class three. If the implant itself is outside the bony envelope or outside the line joining the neighboring teeth, then it's a class four and this is the worst prognosis. Okay, so first of all, we identified the buccolingual position of the crown and the buccolingual position of the implant, and they classified the four classes. Then they classified three subclasses according to the level of the interproximal papilla. And this is actually something we usually miss to look at while we are treating a case. So if the distance between the papilla and the natural neighboring is more than three millimeters, it's a subclass A. If the distance between the tip of the papilla and the neighboring natural is less than three millimeters, it's a subclass B. And if the papilla is at the level of the neighboring or more apical, it's subclass C, which is the worst prognosis. So whenever you address a case, you say this is class one, subclass A, this is class two, subclass A, whatever your classification is. And then they proposed a detailed treatment plan for each class and subclass. I will not go through this right now because, again, it's going to be a very long presentation, but you can refer to the Stefanini presentation on our page or maybe read the paper yourself. Uh, it's, it's really highly recommended. So back to our case, let's classify what we are seeing according to the Zucchelli new classification. This, was, this classification was done in collaboration uh, of the Bologna University and the Michigan University with the Professor Hong Lee Wong. So here you can see that the papilla, one of the... Uh, so, sorry, Dr. Dr. Mula, we, have a, we have a question from Dr. Ahmed El Masri. He's uh, asking Dr. Nada for, uh, for, for... Dr. Nada for implant placement and crown lengthening with bone removal uh, for tooth neighboring to the implant. Can done, can, I think they say, can it, can it be done in the same time? This is actually a good area of research. I've been asking this question and there's not much work about it in the literature. This could be a good area of research because sometimes you think that you have to go for the crown lengthening first and then wait for the remodeling to be able to identify the level of the margin neighboring and the level of the cement enamel junction neighboring after the bone remodeling. And sometimes you may think that you will place the implant with the, with the, in the same session with the static crown lengthening in order to minimize the patient morbidity. We really don't have very strong evidence about it, um, but I will go for doing it in the same procedure if it's possible. If it's, if, it's a, if it's a simple procedure for the patient, I mean. Great. So that you, ad you adjust the level of the bone and you put your implant in relation to the neighboring cemento enamel junction. But this is an in interesting area of research. We can we can think of doing something about this. Okay, do we have another question? No, uh, no, we are good. Okay. okay, so again, back to our case, you can see here that the papilla is almost at the level of the neighbor, uh, gingival, natural gingival margin, the, the, the supposed to be natural gingival margin. And of course, the crown is more apical. So from this picture, we can tell it's a subclass C. Okay, but we cannot tell if it, what's the class because we cannot see the buccolingual view. So if you look at the buccolingual view after the crown removal, you will find that the implant is actually outside the envelope, outside the line joining the two neighboring teeth. So actually, this is the worst prognosis. It's a class, it's a class four, subclass C, which is really the worst. You have everything that's not going right. Yeah, it's, it's a, time, a failure, yeah. Yes. 
at this time we did not have this specification because we did this case maybe in 2018 and this specification was published uh, in 2019 um actually when when you go back to the classification you will find that their recommendation for class uh, four subclass c is implant removal this is the only case they recommended implant removal for because you have the worst prognosis in terms of classes and the worst prognosis in terms of subclasses so the man's implant removal of course you know for financial reasons and for uh, uh working in the faculty reasons they could not do implant removal and to be honest at this point we did not have this classification so i was not really sure about the prognosis things were not that clear at this point when we did the case so we decided to proceed with the soft tissue grafting and the technique i used here was a case report performed by my supervisor dr Hanin Nahas. he he did this case report he published it and then he taught us this technique and taught us how to how to do it and i will uh, I will I will explain it in details. Okay, so what we do is we get a connective tissue graft that has two wings of de-epithelialized tissues and a middle part of keratinized tissue or epithelialized tissues. What he did in his case report is that he uh, harvested a free gingival graft on the bracket table and then he de-epithelialized this wing and this wing and then inserted the graft buccolingually as I'm going to show you. The modification I did for his technique, and this was a case report I published, is to do the de-epithelialization while the graft is still in the palate. You do the de-epithelialization using a high-speed burr and then, or stone, and then you obtain the graft already de-epithelialized and you put it buccolingually on the defect. So again, what we did here was high-speed de-epithelialization of this wing, high-speed de-epithelialization of this wing, and we kept this part intact with the epithelium. We obtained the graft as thick as we could. And as you can see here, this is a de-epithelialized part, de -epithelialized part and this is the keratinized part. And then we put like uh, the, the graft like a saddle, if you know what I mean. There is a connective tissue wing, on uh, inside the buccal tunnel and inside the palatal tunnel and the keratinized part is on the top of the ridge covering the implant head okay is it clear or do, do i have to uh, elaborate more about it no it's clear okay so this is what we had before and this is what we had after you can notice that things are not perfect in terms of uh, gingival level or or the marginal level because as we just said it's a class 4 subclass C so usually it was indicated for uh, implant removal and also as they explained in their classification that sometimes when you have a class 4 and the implant is placed outside of the envelope you have to modify uh, the abutment and do a customized thin abutment that's maybe a little bit angulated to the palatal so that you get more of the soft tissue labeling. Of course, this was not applicable in the circumstance we were at, but you can notice that we had uh, a almost, I, I cannot say it's a full papilla, but we had a good papilla gain on the mesa part. The black triangle is really improved, and the distal papilla is also improved. And you can see that there's no scar formation here, because here we had, I don't know if he went for a free ginger graft before, I think, so we had a scar formation from pre previous surgeries that is actually more or less disappearing here. We have a good color blend. And this case was still temporized. You can, at this point, you can adjust your temporization and your abutment to make it more thin and to place it more palatally so that you obtain more migration of the margin and maybe obtain better results with the modification and thinning of the prosthetic part of the crown. But um, yeah, everyone was satisfied with the result. The patient was satisfied because the black triangle disappeared. The candidate was uh, okay with it. He was happy with the results we got. And the patient actually didn't have a very high lip line. So the margin was not uh, really a problem with this case. I'm done with my presentation, but I would really, really like to acknowledge some people. I would like to acknowledge Dr. Hany uh, He is my He's been my supervisor since 2011 when we first met. He was my supervisor in my master's degree, and this actually was the day of the discussion. 
Uh, he told me everything I know, um, and actually he is now the head of our research uh, team. I'm very proud of uh, his work. I'm very proud of his uh, consistency and of his giving abilities. I would like to thank Dr. Azza Azal Arab. She is uh, she was also my mentor since I was a student, and she is the reason why I got into periodontology in the first place uh, since I was an undergraduate. So thank you so much. And this picture was actually during one of our sessions uh, in the PhD with the amazing course we had with her. She's she's a very passionate and amazing clinician and professor. I would like to thank my uh, team, my education club team. Uh, we started actually our activity almost a year ago. This was our first session in June 2019, based in MSA University. We started this and actually without their hard work and their consistency, we couldn't have gone that far. We actually discussed almost two papers per week. So in 45 weeks, we discussed around 90 papers. I learned a lot during this year and I'm sure they learned a lot too and we enjoyed this process so much together. I'm still looking forward for more sessions and for more learning. And I would like to invite you all, if you would like to join us, even as speakers, you are most welcome. Welcome. You can join the page on Facebook and be part of this education uh, project. And I would like to thank you all for listening. And I really enjoyed today. I hope you uh, enjoyed and, you, and it was beneficial for everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nada. It's a great lecture, a very informative, and uh, we gained. Uh, I think we gained a lot of experience from uh, your work. Uh, here, uh, Lama Al Hariri is uh, thanking you, and she's honored that you are her, her mentor. I'm Hassan and Ru'a Mustafa. Uh, I'd like to say something about uh, Dr. Hani. Uh, is, uh, I was uh, lucky enough to work with him in MIU University for a year or something. And he's very, very good, uh, very good doctor, very, uh, very well educated. Uh, I, I learned from him a lot. Um, we, we thank you so much um, uh, to, to have have you with uh, with us in the Egyptian Academy of Periodontology, and I um, uh, I really appreciate your work, and I appreciate uh, um, if you would uh, uh, accept to be uh, our guest in future uh, webinars or any activity. Sure, it would, be my pleasure. it would be my pleasure. I really enjoyed today, and I hope it was useful for everyone. And it will, it would be my pleasure to be part of this, and I hope it goes well. Inshallah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, just uh, a, 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 a small reminder uh, about uh, Dr. our president, Dr. Ahmed Gamal. Uh, he has he has a lecture tomorrow, a webinar uh, uh, in the BOE uh, Congress, which is held today and tomorrow. Uh, it will be at 2 p.m. Um, uh, we hope that uh, if you have some time, I know it's uh, it's 2 2 p.m. is in the middle of the day, but uh, we will try to. Um, uh, to uh, share it on our page. Uh, I Great. hope that uh, you, you would enjoy, um, because he will talk about the gingival stem cells, which is my uh, PhD uh, uh, thesis, which yes. I, I like it so much. Thank you, Dr. thank Ashman, you so much. One of yeah, the eminent 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 yes, is, yes. is really our mentor and the best we have ever seen. So I would really uh, love to. Thank you so much. Uh, have a good uh, night, and I, I hope to see you soon, inshallah. 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 And good night. Good, good night.